Welcome to this week's edition of Word of Truth Podcast. This is Jordan. And this is Jaron. And this week we're going to start to wrap up our discussion about um, this intertestamental period, the 400 years of silence. Uh, we're going to be looking, as we have the past couple of weeks, about what is going on within these 400 years and kind of the importance as it moves in towards the New Testament. Uh, so to recap what we talked about for the past two weeks, uh, the first week we looked at a very high level worldview of, you know, what was going on through these 400 years, looking across, uh, you know, just like worldwide empires rising, falling, the influences that they had along the way. Uh, then we narrowed it down to just looking at within the Jewish culture what happened. We saw how uh, they divided a little bit, uh, how times changed, how they worship changed, how different ruling bodies came into play, uh, such as the Sanhedrin. Um, and kind of how their religion changed in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, so this week, to kind of dig it a little bit deeper and to look a little bit further and to uh, put God's hand in all of this and see how he used all of these things happening to set the stage for the, the coming Messiah. And what we also want to remember is, uh, or just a side note, when you go back and you read through Esther, again, you don't see God like you, you don't see his name mentioned throughout that whole book, uh, but you know that he's behind the scenes working. So even though here we don't have like an account for us to read, um, all of these things that we learn in secular history, we can see as we match it up with what we read about in, in Daniel um, and the other prophecies, we can see that the Lord, although he's silent, not raising up prophets, He's still doing work, and it's a very important work that he um, is, is going to do as he's preparing the world for then Jesus to come and enter and then to begin his teaching. Um, but again, when we look at it, you know, we see that the Lord is working on his own timeline. So he's going to make sure that certain things take place, um, and man still has his free moral agency. So it's not as if they are robots going about carrying out the Lord's will, but they are still, they're making their own choices, but the Lord is working his plan through the decisions that these men chose. In a way that I really liked putting the scope on this, in one of the articles I read, um, it was written by Dr. D. W. Ekstrand called the intertestamental period and its significance upon Christianity. And he had this quote within that article to help kind of give context to why there's this period. Uh, he said, historically, God had generally allowed a desperate situation to arise before, before presenting his message or providing his deliverance. God simply allowed his people to exhaust their resources and then he would manifest himself. And so like going off this quote throughout all the Old Testament, we saw that uh, where the Israelites, they would go into captivity, then a judge would rise or they go into captivity and then a king would bring them out or um, so on and so forth. And we saw this pattern. And then we get to the end of the Old Testament and God kind of takes his hands off things, leaves uh, the Israelite people in the world to kind of do its thing, uh, exhaust their resources and get to the point where the time is right. And then God would manifest himself and bring about the next phase of what his plan is. And so with that kind of mindset, we look and we see how all of these things play into God establishing his plan and what leads to him then manifesting himself um, moving forward into the New Testament. And so with that being the case, there's a lot here that we can delve into. I was talking to you a little bit earlier that there is like my mind was blown once you start digging into like what happens and then looking at God's hand in all of it. So one way I guess we can start is kind of talking about, in general, the Greek influence. Now, we had talked about um, going into this intertestamental period, one of the, or the Greek empire is one of the first ones to kind of take power, I believe, 323 BC. Um, so that's right after, at the close of the uh, Old Testament, we had, I believe, the Medes and Persians. Yeah. Oh, and then the Greek empire is the very next one to take over. Uh, and as we talked about in that first podcast, a lot of of different things come out of this. Uh, one of the most important being Koine Greek, which was the most commonly spoken version of the Greek language. It wasn't the classical that you would find in writings, but the language of the common man, which is what we find um, 
the New Testament being written in and the Old Testament being translated into throughout this time period. Uh, and the reason this is important is it's considered to be one of the most exacting and precise languages ever to come about. Okay. Uh, just kind of adding to that as we, you know, consider what happens in the New Testament. Um, and when you think back on what we talked about last week about the Pharisees and the Sadducees um, and how they looked at themselves as the spiritual leaders and then you know, even with the false teachers in the New Testament, uh, the Gnostics who believed that they had, that you had to have their knowledge to understand the Word of God. When we look and we see that most of these writings are written in the language that, and in a style that the common man is going to understand, that means that the common man can know and find the path to salvation and know the will of God. Uh, because, like you said, there were other ways and a different, you know, the more classical Greece that they could have used that language. But instead of cutting people out, the word of God was meant for everybody across the board. Right. And that's why Paul says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Um, and so it was very important as you look and you see all the different uh, cultures that were there at this time that existed as Alexander the Great made his conquest, you see the Lord working as he's establishing, okay, here is a way that all men can understand. It's not just going to be in one language um, that differs from what anybody else would know, being Hebrew or um, this higher class language of Greek, but it's going to be something that the common man can know. Well, and the fact that they put it in the common land, the common man's language, and as I was saying, it's the most exact and precise language really ever to come about in human history. Like, if you do word studies on the Greek word, and within one word, for instance, how we say love, they had five different versions of it, you know. And so each of those versions meaning a very exact different thing. And so depending on how they use the word, they could get the exact meaning out. And this, again, the common man's language. So they would be speaking this. And even though you're like, you're a layman, a fisherman or whatever, you're able to precisely state exactly what you're trying to say. And this is important because as we look at it within the context of the New Testament, it allows for the exact preservation of what the doctrine is supposed to be, like supposed to mean. If God means one thing, he had the exact words to say exactly what he meant by that. And so you compare that to other languages, English kind of follows after that pattern since we're based a lot in like the Latin, the Greek uh, roots for how we derive our language. Uh, but for instance, you compare it to more like Hebrew that was originally used or Aramaic along those lines. Um, those were more storytelling picture languages where it was not necessarily exact, but it could show you what was happening, which again, you know, it and like shows it, the Old Testament purpose and then the New Testament, Old Testament storytelling, New Testament doctrine. And when you look, just like a good example of what we're talking about is when um, after Peter had denied Christ and Christ was crucified and resurrected, uh, before he ascended, he asked Peter, do you love me? Okay, and then Peter says, yes, I love you. But then why does Christ continue to ask him? And because in our language, we would look at it and say, well, he answered the question, why are you asking again and again? But when you get into the Greek and you do the word study, you understand the difference in what the type of love that Jesus was asking. Do you love me in this way? And then Peter responded, I love you, but it meant differently, you know. And so that's why, again, you know, I, I really like that you brought this point up because it was very specific um, and the point was in in this original greek uh, very uh, specific in, in what was meant um, so it, it would have been hard to and, and wrong to take it out of context and to take it to mean something different like it really could not um, where today our language is kind of more uh, ambiguous so when we say love, it can mean all types of things, but you have to like really know the context. It's not as specific. 
um, as would have been spoken by them. Yeah, and on top of that, when you look at it, so it's written in the Greek language plus then how much it was preserved. And you see God's hand in that with, as we talked about last week, the preservation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Within those, you have most of the Old Testament, and within like most of the Old Testament, the key verses that needed to be preserved uh, within those. That, you know, there might have been some confusion, whatever. On if you like look in and study what we have found from the Dead Sea Scrolls, you find that some of them are very specific and very purposeful um, within that. But then just the general preservation of it. It's in this period that the Septuagint came about, which is one of our main sources of um, our modern translation of the Old Testament. That was when they brought together 72 of the best Hebrew scholars and translated into this Greek language. And by doing so, plus how well, you know, that culture and those documents have been preserved, we have a very accurate picture of what the Old Testament would have looked like. Um, and so, again, we just see within just this very specific scope, God's hand working and showing you know, these, it wasn't just random that Greece took over and that they uh, had that great of an influence. It wasn't just random, uh, but very purposeful. And like we mentioned, uh, I believe it was two weeks ago or in the first one, when you look at the conquest that Alexander the Great had, uh, he opened up trade routes and passageways into India, into Asia Minor. Now, when you see that you're like okay so we see the grandeur of what he accomplished but then when you apply that to the new testament you see okay look at all the good that came out of that trade route in revelation chapter 2 and verse 3 or chapter 2 and chapter 3 you learn about the seven churches of asia now at that point they needed correction there were things that were wrong but you look at one of them is ephesus and so you look and you can read in acts uh, chapter 20, and then the book of Ephesians, right? You look and you can see the good that they were doing um, and, and sharing the message of God and, and those who they were sending out. Um, and the same with uh, Sardis and Laodicea and Smyrna, and there's all these other, you know, the seven churches, the major ones that we have. Um, and so you think like, okay, so there was this man alexander the great he was powerful he conquered all this land that's awesome that's a great story um and from a historical standpoint that's cool to look back on but now we look at it from a biblical perspective and because that happened the lord opened up a passageway for the the word of god to leave jerusalem and leave judea and that one area and now spread to the then known world yeah, and a lot of that, like as well with um, those ro roadways being established, we also saw, as we talked about la last week, the shift away from the temple and kind of the fall of the priesthood and then the rise of synagogues with that. Those became, synagogues became the place of religious um, <clears throat> instruction, a place of learning, uh, seen by a lot of people outside of just the Jewish culture, but definitely within the Jewish culture. Uh, and so you saw you know, God kind of, in a way, undermined a lot of the Jewish culture. Like, you didn't have the temple anymore because that was corrupted. We saw that at the end of Malachi. All the way through the intertestamental period, it just gets worse and worse and worse until we find ourselves in the New Testament. Um, and so taking that influence away from the temple and spreading it out to the synagogues allowed for more areas for the word to be taught, more areas where, you know, Jews and other people wanting to learn about God were gathering. Um, and with that, it allowed for a greater influence for them, the word to spread much faster. Um, and that's where we see most of the apostles, like Paul, that's where they went and started, you know, their early preaching was in those areas because they knew this is where men are going to be that need to hear the truth. Um, and then after that, you know, they're, they're going to be more public uh, with it. But if they needed to speak and they wanted to share the truth you know that is where they would go yeah and then so along with are there, is there any more kind of historical tie-ins you want um so along with that you can look into prophecy and see a lot of those being fulfilled throughout this intertestamental period um one of the most like 
mind blowing things that I came across while studying, like studying for this podcast was looking into Daniel and then seeing how accurately Daniel predicts what happens throughout this period of time. So we saw in what I believe Daniel 2, the prediction of you had the statue with the bronze head talking about Babylon and then like silver or uh, gold head, silver body, bronze thighs, iron legs and iron and clay feet. And that takes you through. So the bronze head or the gold head is Babylon and then Greece and then I forget who comes up. Persians, Greece and then Rome. Yeah, you're right. I forgot Medo Persians. But anyway, <laughs> it shows you though, and then after that, the rock comes down, collapses that, and then grows in this giant mountain being the church. And so it predicts what happens from that point until Christ comes. That there's going to be the rise of all these empires, and that they're going to come, they're going to do certain things, and then the church is going to come. And so you see that played out exactly over the period of time from that prophecy until Christ comes. You see the rise of all these empires that come in greater stature, taking over the entire world, being greater than the last, and then turning into leading up to Christ coming. Um, not only that, but then we see very precise prophecies uh, dealing especially with Alexander the Great. You can see this in uh, Daniel chapter 8, verses 20 and 21, where it says in this, uh, there's a messenger from God that explained to Daniel what a vision that he saw meant in the earlier part of Daniel. And it's explained as this, the ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of uh, Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, the large horn that is between the eyes of the first king. Uh, as for the broken horn and the four that stood upon its place, the four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. And so this is uh, deriving from Daniel 8, verses 20 and 21, talking about, you know, the rise of these kingdoms to come. And then you saw the one horn in that vision, which was representing Alexander the Great. And the vision goes on then. The horn breaks when it becomes great and turns into four horns. And those four horns are then how Greece gets divided under the sergeants once Alexander the Great dies. And so we see this actually played out as well. These prophecies presented to Alexander the Great. And Josephus records his reaction uh, because at some point in time, I forget exactly the year, he comes to Jerusalem. Um, and is approaching it to try and take it over. And Josephus records for us, for Alexander, when he saw the multitude at the distance in white garments, while the priest stood clothed with fine linen and the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing, with his mitre on his head, having a gold plate, whereupon the name of God was engraved, he approached by himself and adored that name and first saluted the high priest. Whereupon the kings of Syria and the rest were surprised at what Alexander had done and supposed him to uh, disordered in his mind. However, Parmenio alone went up with him and asked him how it came to pass when all others adored him that he should adore the high priest and the Jews. To whom he replied, I did not adore him, but God who hath honored him with his high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream in, the vi in this very habit of clothing when I was in Dios in Macedonia, who exhorted me to make no delay, but boldly pass over the sea to come here where he would conduct my army and would give me dominion over the Persians. Whence now seeing this person in it, remembering that vision, I believe that brings his army under the divine conduct. And when the book of Daniel was shown to him, him being Alexander the Great, wherein Dan Daniel declared one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended. And he was glad that he bade them uh, ask what favors they pleased of him, whereupon the high priest desired that they might pay no tribute on the seventh year, and he granted all that they desired. So that was a lot, but kind of breaking that down, we had this prophecy, and then on the other hand, secular history from Josephus shows that Alexander the Great had a dream that correlated with this prophecy. They meet in Jerusalem and figure out, okay, this is actually the prophecy that's happening, and then he goes on and do the great things and fulfills that prophecy, as predicted in Daniel. And then if you look into Daniel 11, Throughout a lot of that, that, there's an article that I can link into the description um, where it basically breaks down Daniel 11 and all of the verses in there. First four verses talks about Alexander the Great coming and taking over much of the, you know, much of the world rising to power. And then after that, it talks about the conflict between um, the Seleucid Empire and the Egyptian Empire and the conflict that then goes on between them, as we talked about in the first one. 
And then from that, the abomination of desolation is also discussed, which I think we briefly hit on, where uh, the temple, they raised an altar in the temple and forced everyone to sacrifice like pigs to Zeus and so on and so forth for a period of time. Um, that also is <laughs> within Daniel fulfilled throughout this 400 years of silence. So it's really, it's really impressive whenever you look through and you see like, all right, technically nothing was prophesied in this period of time, but God's hand is still working with everything that is happening within this period. Yeah. And we see too, like, again, this was prophesied by Daniel and this is before the Israelites are returning to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so there are these things where Christ cannot come yet. So all of these things need to take place first. Because as God had said in the vision in Daniel chapter 2, it's after or during this time when what is known as the Roman government or, or empire comes that then the kingdom will be established, which was established with Christ. And so you see during this time, again, he's working on his own timeline as he is going and fulfilling these prophecies. Um, because it, like all of these things had to take place. And so it was super important uh now as we get kind of more towards is it okay to go into the roman government yeah so when we look and you you know wonder why was there such an oppressive government uh that needed to come in well during this time in in that span between with the rise and the fall of these different empires there's so much turmoil going on there's so much war and there's no peace in the land now, Rome was rough, um, and, and their justice system, um, you know, they, they were very strict, but that was what was needed to bring peace within that area. Um, so, again, you're going to have the um, tension between the Jews and the government, but you needed somebody there uh, to bring about justice. Um, and, and help set that stage for Christ to come into a world that is, in a way, united. So you don't have all these random kingdoms popping up and these tribes that are warring. You have people here that are run under a government that is allowing um, different religions to be practiced. And now here comes the Christ into this world that is, you know, that has been set for him. And it also works, like, they allowed for religions to happen, but it also helped to phase out the influence of Judaism. Because as we had talked about, like, um, well, I don't know, actually, if we did hit on it. You have the rise of Herod, and Herod kind of buys out the high priests. Well, they're, the high priests have been bought out multiple times throughout, you know, this entire period of time. And so they're kind of, like, the high priesthood, basically the pinnacle of Judaism, is no longer sanctified there's not even by the time you get to the new testament there's not even like a tribe of levi or a person from the tribe of levi as a high priest in the temple anymore and then on top of that the temple that they do have is furnished by rome is not you know the people's uh temple anymore but it's herod who then goes in and beautifies the temple as a service from rome to them so it's no longer their temple, but it's Rome's temple run by them. And then as you kind of progress further, you start to have the strife between the Roman government and the Jews, and then the Roman government and the Jews slash Christians, which leads to AD 70, which is when the temple is officially ruined. And that's kind of like the end of the official Judaism. And again, I think that kind of speaks towards the move that was trying to be made from uh, religion being seen like the, the center of religion was the temple for the Jews. And then you hear Paul talk about how our body is the temple. So it's not, religion isn't just something that you practice here and you have to go here to be or to know that you are in the sight of God. But it's to remember it's personal. Um, and I think that was an important 
shift that had to be made. Um, and you kind of see, um, you know, as Christ comes, that's what he is preaching uh, and trying to teach us that it's the heart, you know, this is to be a temple. My body is to be a temple for the Lord. And so it's not just whenever I'm here in this building that I'm in the sight of God, but everywhere I go, I'm seen by God. Yeah. And so unless you have any other topics you want to hit on, that's a very brief overview. Uh, I would strongly suggest studying through Daniel and seeing some of those prophecies. I didn't go super in depth because some of it would take a while to kind of read through and give the entire context for discussional purposes. <laughs> and so like for the listeners that are kind of like sitting there and just trying to take it all in, I think they would get bored with me reading through the entirety of Daniel 11 and then explaining it. So for further study, look through Daniel 11. There are plenty of resources out there for you to study it deeper. Uh, Daniel 8 has some prophecies that deal with this area. If you dig into the history of it, there, I have thoroughly enjoyed this study and I'm sure you have too. So, you know, dig into it. It's there's so much within that period. Yeah, and you know, it's important not to just jump in for us to know what we need to do to be saved um, and how to be faithful and remain faithful and how to repent. We have to know the New Testament, but it's also important as we're told that the Old Testament, the former things were written for our learning. Go back and read that, but don't just jump in between it because in our minds, we just flip to the next book and it's like, okay, so now it just picks up here. No, look and see, right? Because it's helped me be convinced in, uh, in the Lord and knowing that he's still, you know, he's working for me. I'm, I don't see him working in my life physically. Uh, he's not speaking to me, but I can look back and see, wow, look at how he worked through this time where we don't have a record of what he did. But you can see through the rise and the fall of all these empires, the fulfillment of the prophecies and how the stage was set for Christ. You can see that he was working there. And if he was working then, then he's working in my life. And, you know, how can I open up my eyes now to see how he is working behind the scenes? Yeah. And although there isn't any like scripture that we accept as quote unquote canonical as like inspired by God. There's a ton of writings that are within that called, we discussed it a little bit last week with the Apocrypha, uh, first and second Maccabees, that kind of stuff to give you a historical perspective, because we're working on a continuous timeline. Just because the old Testament ends, that does not mean that, you know, the plight of God's or that God's plan, I guess, ends or the plight of the Jews ends. That 400 years is filled with stuff happening that is leading us to the new Testament. So to have the proper context, you need to know the Old Testament and you need to know what happened in those 400 years to understand fully what is going on from where Matthew starts to where Revelation ends. So in order to get the full picture, you like we have these writings preserved for us for a reason. Now, they aren't necessarily for doctrine, but they are for our understanding. God, you know, just as God kept the Old Testament preserved for us, he, he kept these for a reason. So, you know. It's important for us to study along with this stuff just to kind of deepen our understanding of what's going on leading to the beginning of the New Testament. So with that being said, I'd like to uh, thank you all for listening to this week's edition of Word of Truth podcast. I hope that you've enjoyed this study as much as I have, because for me, it's opened my eyes to a whole new realm of things to look into as a Christian, a new way to uh, deepen my understanding in a way that I hadn't really thought of until, Jordan, you brought this up as kind of a topic to go through. Um, we hope that you'll be with us as we continue on uh, studying whatever we decide to study in the future. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening. I'll give you a friendly reminder that he who has an ear to hear, listen up. And as always, have a great week.